world. <laughs> Thanks for coming today. My name's Eric Kittner. I'm a corporate and securities attorney at a law firm called Snow Wilmer here in Denver. I was also fortunate to be a part of the Colorado Blockchain Council, where we had some, uh, some new legislation that was passed last session around the Digital Token Act. I was part of that and honored to be here moderating a panel today on government and how we can impact social good. And we've got a really great panel, and I'll let, let them introduce themselves. Uh, and we really want to try to make this educational and try to really share some of the information we're learning with all the rest of you. So welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Is my mic on? Can you guys hear me? Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Corbin Page, and I'm head of product uh, at Consensus Codify. So we're generally the technology partners that are brought in to do advisory work, pilots, and POCs with different governments around the world about Web3 and about blockchain. I would say a couple years ago, we were seeing a lot of identity, a lot of registry type use cases. And more recently, it's been a focus on central bank digital currencies, as well as different tokenized assets, specifically municipal bonds in the government space. Hi, everybody. It's kind of, it's kind of loud, so we can't really hear ourselves up here. Uh, my name is Yev Muchnik. I'm an attorney with a firm called Launch Legal here in Denver. Um, I'm a technology attorney and have been counseling uh, blockchain companies in different industries for the last four years or so. I'm really excited to be counseling Opolis, um, who is doing amazing things in this space as well and who's part of ETH Denver. Can you hear? There we go. I'm Hannah Parsons, and I'm here with Exponential Impact, which is an early stage technology accelerator. So this is our third year here at ETH Denver, and we've had each year um, in 2018 and 2019, we've had companies that have been participating in this hackathon who have then ultimately come through our early stage accelerator and received um, an equity investment. And uh, uh, those companies are still uh, in business, and it's been great to see some of these ideas go from concept to business over the years, and we can talk a little bit about what use cases we're seeing there. I'm Jared Olson from Wyoming. I serve in the Wyoming legislature, represent District 11 in Cheyenne. I'm just a simple, big city lawyer for what that means in Wyoming is a population of 60,000 people. A couple of years ago, I got together with an old cow hand from Northeast Wyoming, Tyler Lindholm, and, and uh, together we started the Blockchain Task Force, ran some legislation. You may have heard of it, kind of set the groundwork for the regulatory framework in the, in the country. And uh, just, I was here last year, really excited to be here. Great conversation, love to hear how everything's moving forward and, and happy that uh, two Hicks from Wyoming could contribute. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Thad Bott. I am the blockchain architect for the state of Colorado, and we are super happy to be at ETH Denver for uh, the first time this year. Um, we've got some use cases that some of the teams are working on upstairs that we're excited to see uh, how, they, how they flesh out. We're in the midst of formulating what our, uh, what our policies and technology stacks look like um, in terms of blockchain and how it can help enhance the data availability, transparency, and trust within uh, Colorado State data. So Thad, you mentioned that you're working on some use cases. So I'd like to first start our first question about what are the big use cases for government? Um, and why do you think blockchain can solve these problems? Absolutely. So I think that uh, you know the, the big use case, the big giant bullseye, um, is not is not necessarily where we're where we're headed directly. I think the big giant bullseye clearly is self sovereign identity, um, and all that goes along with that in terms of owning your own data, in terms of owning access and being able to provision your own credentials. Um, looking at asset ownership like vehicles, land, all of those sorts of things tie into identity. So I think that rather than trying to boil that ocean out of the gate, we're looking at um, taking some smaller slices that, that look at what the periphery is around identity and figure out how those use cases um, are able to track back in a proof of concept way that provides value to the agencies and the businesses and the people who have to interact with those agencies and businesses. And you know that you guys have uh, there's a Colorado DMV app, right? Where you upstairs you can put your app, uh, put your ID right on your phone. 
Um, uh, so is there, is there additional things other than self-sovereign identity, which is this you know, great idea, um, I think everybody's reaching for it, um, but I mean that's, that creates a tremendous amount of change in the legal requirements of how, what data, how, how we store data. Um, are, there, are there other interesting projects that you could talk about that are focused on how blockchain can make our daily lives better in terms of vis-a-vis -vis the government? Yeah, I think the, the Colorado Digital Identification Program is a very interesting first step and on-ramp to get people sort of used to the idea of being able to provide identity information in a more limited way that allows them to um, basically shield certain aspects of data for the particular use case that's at hand. So if you need to go into a liquor store and, and buy alcohol, legally you have to be 21. You don't have to ha have that that... Uh, person know where you live. You don't need to, them to know your specific birth date. Um, so being able to shield that is something that we've introduced in the My Colorado Digital ID. And I think that it starts to get buy-in from the public and people begin to understand how they can be in control of their data and, and who they share it with. Um, I think that the, the surrounding use cases that are very blockchain specific um, that are that are identity related, such as providing uh, attestation endpoints for KYC applications, um, will provide a great value and ease, especially for people who are looking. Um, if you if you've registered on a crypto exchange, which I'm guessing most of you have, um, you know, taking taking a scan of your driver's license or your ID and trying to go through that process can be cumbersome. If if that's smoothed out, at least for the residents of Colorado, by providing uh, attestation endpoints for KYC on a on a application layer, then you know all the better. That makes your life easier. It certainly makes the life easier of the exchange operators. Um, and I think that there are so many areas in which that can uh, help people interact with government services more smoothly. And in, and in Wyoming, you guys really sparked something amazing with a movement towards what can we do we do at a state level. To change the laws, to adopt the laws, to adopt this new new economy, new asset class, new opportunities. You said you had this great meeting with a, an old cowhand from from Wyoming. So, what were you hoping to get out of that that solution? What what do you hope that that helps uh, improve citizens of Wyoming's lives on on a daily basis? Sure. So there's, I mean, there's so many bases to cover. I would just say number one, number one base is the bank. And this, so we're talking about right now, uh, we have two applications in, and I consider that at this point real world. It's hitting the ground, the assets are committed, and they're there. And what does that really mean? And how does that circle back to the citizens of Wyoming? Well, I mean, you know, think of uh, an entity that holds four billion, five, six billion dollars in assets, whatever it is, and they're paying tens of thousands of dollars annually across the country to deal with money transmitter laws and compliance across all of these states. And then here we are in Wyoming when we said, hey, is there a different way we can do that? Yeah, we can. We can get rid of all of that. And that's basically what we did. And now we've got, we got two, real, two real world applications. Um, how does that filter down through? Well, I, you know, to the citizens of Wyoming, it's going to come in many different ways. It's, of course, going to come in, in jobs. But also when, when you're a company that's not spending tens of millions of dollars on those compliances, um, it drives companies to Wyoming. So those are real world things for, for, uh, for Wyoming. Um, I'd say that's number one, but you know, the, list, the list goes on. I, I wanna talk about one thing um, that was just mentioned, you know, how does, and that's dealing with, the, with your identity and protecting your, your data and knowing that you own your data. And I think there's really two major things um, getting ready to happen in Wyoming that we're moving forward now. Um, one deals with um, deals with owning your data, but in a, in a different respect, and that's with the code itself, so the speech itself. Something I'm really excited about in Wyoming right now is, uh, is our protection of digital speech laws. That's moving through Wyoming, and as, I, as I've moved around even here today, I've talked to folks who, who are pointing to real-world prosecutions and real-world cases, and so being able to not just own your, understand that you own your data, but that you own and have a protection for what you create. So the freedom to code, the freedom to develop, the freedom uh, to be the entrepreneur that you want to be, um, knowing that that is protected like any other form of speech, um, digital expression, that's huge. 
Um, and so I think that's really going to hit the map um, for citizens and for the country uh, when it moves forward in Wyoming. Now, Hannah, you and I were on the Blockchain Council here in Colorado together, and, and you had a chance to work with your work with the incubator in Colorado Springs. With a lot of companies that are coming through that um, are looking for opportunities with government or maybe through grants or maybe through partnerships or maybe through um, actually providing service to them as a vendor. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you think this effort to try to bring government to be able to use blockchain technology for social good can have a positive impact, how you can see this accelerate sort of the development of these new companies that are coming forth that you've seen in the, in the incubator space. Great. Yes. Yeah, so we've had, um, we've had several companies come through the accelerator and then now participate in our incubator that are blockchain based. And uh, one of the best examples, I would say, uh, of a government partnership with one of those companies, and it is Biteable Foods. So they are in the supply chain uh, traceability uh, industry. And they received this year, uh, they went through the accelerator in 2018 and then into the incubator program. And then this year, they received nearly a half million dollar uh, grant from US Department of Agriculture. And so that's a significant partnership. And the reason they were able to do that was um, because they have a solution, they had, had, they had started to work with a couple suppliers in the beef industry and the egg industry, and both of those were companies who were trying to avoid food fraud. So, uh, so for example, if it's a company that has Colorado beef, I'm sure you have the same challenge in Wyoming, um, where they're trying to, there's a lot of fraud. So people are saying, I've got Colorado beef when maybe 5% is. So even though, as we all know, some of the, the challenges in blockchain are the first mile, last mile kind of questions, and they were able to make a partnership with USDA um, because they are able to work with small suppliers. So because they're working with small suppliers and they're starting um, at the USDA inspection point, and going through all of that, their partnership with USDA is trying to see how they can develop this and pilot it with some at least 20 small food suppliers um, to really protect uh, small farms and the food supply as well as the traceability. So that's been an example of how uh, that technology is now being embraced by USDA and this in this grant project. I also think the accelerator incubator piece is really important because blockchain uh, companies, it's, it takes a while to figure out how to make these things work. So it's increasingly important, I believe, to have companies come through the programs and have as we try to give them as much runway as possible because it takes a long time to get these things done. We've been able to work with um, many of the companies that have come through. One of them was a company that we met here last year, Carbos, and they were working on trying to democratize carbon offsets. You can't do that without interfacing with the government agencies. And so I think over time, being able to introduce uh, companies, to, it also helps the, the government agencies understand what the blockchain companies are trying to do and why and how. So we've seen imp uh, a lot of improvements on both sides. Now, yeah, you've worked with a lot of companies in this space who have all these opportunities in front of them, but a lot of challenges, I think, with trying to raise money, trying to use the technology in various ways, whether it's a lot of legal restrictions out there. Um, I would love your thoughts on what, what, could, what, what do you think could be done on a regulatory legal standpoint to help improve uh, the adoption of this technology in government, uh, as well as for the companies that you're seeing that are trying to raise capital and create new businesses? I, mean, I think what Colorado is doing is amazing because it's actually opening up the kind of the, the, the platform and the forum for industry leaders and government players to come together and have these open discussions on what's working, what's not working. And I've seen it with Dora, who's doing an amazing job and, and kind of pushing or being open to these conversations. But and there's so many challenges in the space. Um, obviously, starting back in, in 2016, 2017 with, with raising capital and ICOs and that kind of crazy heyday of, of not having any kind of regulatory certainty, um, but tr trying to navigate that anyway. Um, I guess kind of going back to the, to the topic of, of the panel, for me, you know, public good, social good, the, 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 the definition has been so skewed, right, by, by what we're now normalizing as society and also what's being Kind of propagated by the, the government, and so technology, and you know, as evidenced by a lot of the companies that I've been working with, 
allows for that agnostic sense to, to come into play, that it, there's no, you know, it, it kind of shifts back our moral compass into the right direction, but we can't do it without the government. We need the bridge between sort of the, the way out there, wild, wild west, and, and enterprise, really, the, the, big, the big businesses, the big, the big guys there. So we need that bridge, and, and the companies that I've been working with have, have been doing a really good job at doing that. So at Consensus, you know, Consensus has been an amazing partner. When we went through the Blockchain Council process, um, they were help, very helpful in sort of helping us with this true stakeholder process, which I think Tahana mentioned. Uh, it, it was really important to try to bring everybody together uh, in one room, regulators, industry, government, um, uh, legislators, uh, lawyers, uh, to help kind of think through um, the regulatory issues. And Consensus has been a, a great partner in sort of having an understanding of various projects that are working on uh, throughout the country uh, and, and, and how you work with government, right? So, Corbin, you do a lot of work on sort of the municipal bond area. How, can you give us some thoughts on how an organization like Consensus and others can help sort of governments think about how to properly stakeholder the process and bring in um, input so that we make sure that when we adopt these solutions and we put new laws in place, this is actually going to make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it always starts with education. Uh, especially, you know, given some of the, the actions in this space in 2017, highlighting the benefits of having self-sovereign identity, some of the supply chain solutions, and having kind of just more fluid value transfer allows us to be like, hey, we can use this technology for things other than minting tokens out of fresh air, right? Uh, I think at its core, blockchain is all about like the internet of value. And so when we talk about municipal bonds, we're not just bringing down the costs of issuing and administrating those bonds, but we're also kind of providing a more inclusive platform for allowing anybody to kind of have access to this particular asset. Let me give an example. Uh, if you were a Apple stock owner, uh, what if you got some kind of benefit every time you walked into the Apple store, right? You get to skip the, the line at the Genius Bar and you get to go right to the front, right? With a blockchain, all that ownership and all those transactions can be queried super easily, and so you can have proof of ownership directly into any mobile like application out there. So for the government space, you have a municipal bond that is used to create a community center or to build a park in a new neighborhood. The folks that are actually putting skin in the game to kind of finance that operation could also have benefits once that project is completed. They can get updates on how the project is developing along, and then they are a more engaged stakeholder within their community, and then they also help finance this public good. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle of kind of value transfer when you have these tokenized municipal bond offerings. And with the, you know, with the municipal bond project that you're working on, uh, you know, what, what do you, how would you, uh, let's say a year from now or two years from now, how, do you, how would you measure progress? How would you start to see how these things are actually helping the communities reaching uh, better, uh, a broader range of customers, getting this in the hands of more uh, uh, customers that uh, investors that might want it, more cities adopting it? How, how do you think that we should think about how we measure our impact we're having um, on some of these projects where you have government and blockchain coming together? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, the first one is, of course, cost cutting. Uh, a lot of these processes today are very onerous, very paper-based. Um, even the coupon payments for these bond investors uh, go out with written checks to mailing addresses that may have changed for those individuals, right? With, uh, with a blockchain, you have one digital wallet that you can push things out to, and it cuts down the cost uh, dramatically. I would say, secondly, you have community engagement. If there's one thing the blockchain industry knows how to do well. It's how to throw a hackathon. It's how to throw a conference. It's how to get people engaged with a new community and excited about it integrating particular APIs into applications that can be very cross, like cross-cutting. So some of the things we've discussed with municipalities is not only doing a tokenized issuance, but then also running hackathon events, community engagement, so you can actually get the benefits of this digitally native like value rather than it being a paper document that lives in a file cabinet somewhere. Now, yeah, you, you and I have talked a little bit about co-ops. And Colorado is kind of a really interesting place. Maybe not know, but it's almost kind of the Delaware of co-ops. Um, thank got thank you, Jason Weiner. Jason Weiner to credit for that. Yes. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot how we can provide better value to the community. You know, one way, and I know Governor Polis has had a commission on this, is how we bring more value to the employees, right? And co-op models allows the whole community to share in the benefit of that. 
So maybe I thought you could talk a little bit about your experience in working with companies that are they're trying to think about these new models and how you can push value into all the stakeholders within the company, employees, customers, users. That's exactly it. I mean, it's, it's really the alignment of, of the different uh, participants in that system. It also allows, it, it mimics a lot of the DAO principles of governance um, with one member, one vote. But the great thing about Colorado is that you have so many different levels of, of participation, whether you are a member owner or whether you are a vendor that, a vendor that comes in or even as an investor. Um, the really cool thing as well, Eric, as you know, is the issuance of securities within a co-op system that are exempt from registration. So I think that's really something um, to be on the lookout in the future uh, because we haven't really tapped into that as much as we should be and as we can and, and hopefully that we will um, in order to kind of bolster uh, these types of legal frameworks. Now, Hannah, as you kind of leave the incubator world and start moving into the private, back to the private industry. Um, what, what, do you, what, what would you want from future government blockchain councils or other initiatives to, to how, how, do you, how would you like to see these, for these uh, initiatives continue to develop thoughts, ideas, leaderships? Do you think additional conferences is helpful? you think bringing more government uh, bureaucrats, regulators together in a room? Is it more education? What, what do you think some of the answers are to continue to push this progress we've made? That's a really good question because, as you know, uh, from the from our perspective on the blockchain council, um, we we wanted to start with uh, a light hand. So our first kind of role, call to action was do no harm. So sometimes when you introduce legisl legislation, it can get um, a life of its own and have unintended consequences. And 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 if you especially in this space where people are maybe overreaching sometimes for consumer re protection, which is a it's a good thing. Um, so I think education, Eric, is still uh, something that's really valuable. And I would say the most value add that we would see, I believe, because I think our state, the state agencies are doing so great. I see our securities commissioner re represented here today. And so I just think having, having ha that pushed out to county levels would be incredibly valuable because having some of the counties embrace, there's so many things around identity and titles and property and all of those things that, the, that are kept at the county level. So I think some education around uh, how you push that out into other municipalities because doing something at the state level is only so valuable if it's administered through a local agency. And so I think really that's going to be where we see another level of incredible value as we start to expand that education. And then so how do we bring that down to the legislator who has to sort of figure out the balance between these really important ideas about trying to protect consumers but bring them new opportunities, new technology, be flexible with government but not expose them to undue risk. Um, do you see the states, I think, I think I know the answer, but do you think the states should be the ones pushing these new ideas and that we should continue to develop these state-based initiatives or should we focus our energy at working with our friends in the federal government to try to adopt some of these things? I think with Hester's uh, SEC Commissioner's uh, proposal last week on Rule 195. I think a lot of that you see in, in, in uh, some homage to what Wyoming did and what I think is represented in the Colorado Digital Token Act, uh, which I freely admit we borrowed heavily from Wyoming on. Um, and I think, you know, I think I see something where there can be state initiatives, state work that can be done that builds momentum towards bigger solutions. Kind of looking at that in levels, you know, the top level, we're look, when we're talking about the federal government, I hesitate to ever say that the federal government could get it right. Um, I'm, I very much believe that the states should leave the charge on it, absolutely, and they are. And um, there's been a lot of pushback from the feds, obviously, um, but that I think just proves that the states are right and we're moving here. But if you take it down to another level, that's where I think it gets really exciting, and that's the people down at this level. At the... The, the, the problem with government is that it is inherently centralized. And so just even in the theoretical standpoint, it is the exact opposite. It is the antithesis of decentralization. It's what the government is. And so what's, what is actually really exciting is that I think right now we're just at the cusp of when you talk about education and, and education, as we begin to regulate and we begin to uh, move legislation forward, we move a lot of this, the private industry forward in this area, what we're also doing when we do that, when we regulate in law, 
is we're enshrining our values as a society in law. And so right now, that's not being held as much um, in the minds of the generations that exist. But down the road, I think generations will begin to think about their government differently. And so that's where it comes back to that centralization, decentralization idea. This idea that you own your own data, that you own what is, what is yours, the self-sovereignty, the decentralization, all of that, as we begin to move this forward, begins to instill in the generations. And then I think you not only is it a question of should the federal government lead on this or should the states lead on this, but I think a decade from now, that's, it's going to be the question of who's really leading on this, and, and, and that's us. And so um, just continuing to educate, but educating also through our laws, I think, um, gets us there um, through time as we enshrine our new values. Now, Thad, as the person who's going to be responsible or partly responsible for bringing Web 3.0 to Colorado government, how is this going to work? This seems like a pretty complicated thing to go from where we started, which is this is the big use case. You, you, you brought it up. This is the big use case we want, self-sovereign identity, which is mean government sort of gets out of the business of being this sort of holder of record and, and it gets more into the business of providing services to the community, um, or at least that it sort of moves away from that. How do, you, how do you transition a system built on where it is now to where we want to go with this self-sovereign identity Web 3.0 model? Right. Well, that, that's clearly a tough nut to crack, but I don't think that... You're not going to solve it right now? <laughs> I, I, don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's that tough from a technology perspective. Um, I think that you know, distributed ledger technology is all about consortiums. It's all about building communities that can agree on the data, agree on the rules, and that can happen state by state. Um, but it's not, it's not a technical issue. It's a philosophical issue. It's a social issue. It's an issue of community building and agreeing upon rules that transcend state borders. Um, I think certainly, currently, the federal government has a role to play in, in interstate commerce. And if they can set a standard bar that any states can decide you know, they have additional requirements, then things like supply chains can be built that can track products, goods, and even services across state borders that meet those federal requirements, but that also can allow states to impose any additional regulations. And that's sort of, sort of where you get the value in, in, in blockchain. It's going across borders and um, getting that buy-in from, from various different organizations and, and municipalities is super critical. Hannah talked about pushing it out to the county levels, right? They've got certain things that, that blockchain would be a great uh, technology to solve for as well. And, so I, I think it goes both ways. I think that the state level is essentially the tip of the spear right now, and that um, you know it's it's maybe it's maybe an exploding arrow when it when it sinks, and it, we need to push the concepts to the federal level, but also down to the county level. And when we, and when we try to push these things out to the county level, you know what we often have found, and I know I think I saw some folks around here on the council that kind of worked on this project is the counties don't have much money. <laughs> they don't have a lot of resources to tackle something like this. And we, we were talking earlier about, you know, DHS is doing amazing R&D in this space, right? And they have an R&D project that may be enough to, like, stand up a whole solution for you. Like, how do we get to a point where we can fund these, these initiatives at a, at a local, at a state, at a local level? How do we get R&D done at a federal level that's shared at a state level? Maybe you have some ideas on, on sort of what can be done. Is it, you know, is it public-private partnerships? Is it bringing some uh, enterprises to the table that can help with these solutions so it's not just government-funded? I, I think it's certainly public-private enterprises. I think that um, the fact that there's not much money, but there's certainly a lot that's maybe not being optimized in the way that it's spent. Um, re, reformulating the way that the budgets are work at, at worked at the, at the county level and putting maybe more towards innovative uh, solutions that can help reduce costs in the long run. I mean, right now the amount of paper, physical paper that's pushed is phenomenal. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that a lot of these blockchain initiatives could be funded just in the postage that's being spent. Um, at, at the county level, legitimately. And I feel like that um, the opportunities are there. It's a matter of transforming state information technology into a more agile, modern idea of what innovation and research and development looks like. Um, a lot of states aren't, aren't set up for that right now. They're trying to maintain what they've got 
um, without solving for um, future-proofing the problems to a degree. And I think that's where we need to go. Eric, I was going to add on to that. One of the things that happens at the federal level that doesn't happen at the state and local level is the SBIRs, like the Small Business Innovation Research Grants, in ways that the federal government, the Department of Defense especially, has said, we can't innovate fast enough, so we're going to do these challenges so that the, the private sector early stage companies can come in and show us what they're doing because we're, we're pretty sure they're doing more than we can and they're innovating faster. And what that does is avoids a ton of expense and procurement processes. And if the state and local and county level would open up a, small, a smidge of their budget to say, we don't know what we don't know, but we need to allocate some of our budget to figure this out and, and do it in the form of a challenge grant, that's, that is how the Department of Defense is innovating right now. And it, the counties, the, the cities, all of those groups, I think, could pay for some of these innovations just by, by overcoming some of their challenges in procurement. Yeah, we've had a lot of discussions today about maybe the net regulatory front is just <laughs> changing how procurement works, which is going to be a pretty esoteric topic, but can really make a difference in terms of the companies out here. And you know, Colorado's already made an amazing effort by working with the hackathon here to sort of work on these new projects. And there's other ways that we can think about how we can bring innovation. And Corbin, I know as you try to reach out to more municipalities to try to think about innovation, right? How do you get them to think about this in a new way? Well, we've always, we've always purchased this product this way. How do you convince them to move to a new solution? Do you have to bring in a trusted vendor partner uh, that can sort of be that, like, make them look feel and good, and then you kind of have these kind of scrappy blockchain companies behind you to make it work? Or how, what do you think the solution is to try to push these innovations along uh, into the government? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, uh, I think when you're starting out, you kind of have to pick your jurisdictions carefully, right? We have representatives from Wyoming and Colorado on this stage because they've taken the leap first and they've set, uh, they've basically kind of cleared the path a little bit for others to follow. So especially in the municipal space, you know, we're looking for the folks that are reaching out that are saying like, how can I bring jobs to my jurisdiction? How can I explore more innovative ways of financing public projects? Uh, and like, as soon as we have a couple of these examples out in the wild and we have the ROI that is demonstrable, whether that's cut cost, whether that's more buy-in, whether that's more community participants in these types of projects, um, I think the numbers are just gonna speak for themselves. And you're gonna have municipalities that are gonna be scrambling along to catch up to some of these innovative leaders that are gonna be the first ones to pioneer the space. So yeah, if we could wave our, wave our magic wand and sort of imagine what we'd want this to become, and if we have this goal of self-sovereign identity in the future, sort of what would be the, the change that you think that we could make if you, had, if you were the dictator, you could control everything, what would, you get, what would be the key thing to get this adoption across the finish line? Not easy what questions at this point. Gosh, I have to think about that a little bit more, but uh, I mean, uh, just making it uh, the user experience really easy, right, and and palpable, just so that we don't uh, just like you know the the internet is a is a public good, right, and the, and the same thing for blockchain. I hope for blockchain to be what the internet is for us now. Anybody else on the panel that has any thoughts on the one thing that we could change? if you were in charge, that you think would help push this innovation blockchain adoption? Yeah, I mean, you have, you have joked that it's the million dollar question, but, um, you know, money does play a huge factor in that. I was thinking of this concept of, you know, you weighed in, well, if you could get these private, uh, that's really what we want, right, at the county level, but how do you do it without just, you know, pushing the money down? In Wyoming, one of the real, just real world, you know, red meat examples of what could really change things in Wyoming is, is simply just digital records, land records. It's huge in Wyoming. We're a mineral state. Um, we're, we're based on coal, oil, and natural gas. A lot of that's changing in Wyoming, but that was our history for 100 years. Then throw in our, um, our third largest industry is ag. And so, again, we're talking about land. And uh, I'm a lawyer, so I deal in that, in that sphere a lot. And, and uh, we just have uh, generations and generations of, of, of complicated deeds and, and uh, mistakes and millions and millions of dollars that are spent figuring those out. And now today we have this technology um, that we could s just simply 
place um, this data on a, on a ledger, on a blockchain, um, and have the authenticity that we need and the reliability that we need going forward for the next hundred years. In Wyoming, all of our uh, you know, records are kept at the county level, so this is where we run into this issue where we try to spearhead this at the state level. We create a, a pilot program. We brought in a public-private um, uh, partnership, but it's, it, you know, it's not moving, and it's not moving without money. And so, you know, if I, I guess if I had the money, um, I think that, you know, that's what I would do for the day. Uh, I mean, education is key. You can't just change people's hearts and minds. But if you had the money to move things, you could move things at the local level, I think, like in Wyoming, a lot quicker. So, Thad, is it a money problem? Is it a creativity problem? Uh, what, what, is, it a, is it a federal regulata- regulation problem? What are, what are some of the things that, are, that are, you think that would hold us back from this vision of where we want to go? So right now, I think that it primarily boils down to a maturity problem. We've got Bitcoin is 11 years old. Ethereum is six years old. Uh, That's as long as smart contracts on blockchains have been operating. Um, That's not a long time. Um, To prove out a technology, we need proof of concepts. We need implementation. We need security testing, pen testing at the state level for our uh, data integrity requirements and our security requirements. We need to be able to perform solid security and pen testing against any technologies that we introduce for large-scale use of publicly uh, stewarded data. Um, and that needs to be you know, bulletproof. Um, so I think maturity is a big issue. Uh, the, more, the more experimentation happens with it and the more we're able to put use cases into proof of concept practices, um, the more we're able to convince the businesses that this is worthwhile. This is going to ease the, ease the relationship between the data, the agencies, and the end users who own the data and who need to access and use it. Um, so I think it, it really does sort of boil down to that. Um, market penetration, it needs, it needs to be something that is practically invisible, but also very much trusted. And that, that comes with implementations, right? And, and, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of a chicken or the egg problem, right? Because uh, uh, you talk about maturity, but how many opportunities are these companies going to get, right? So it, it ends up becoming this, I think, important sort of process between well-established companies that have sort of been there, done that, that can provide that, that solution to the government or a large vendor, but then bringing these other companies along. So it kind of gives you a sense that it is a lot, I think, about collaboration and working together. So we have, we, we haven't gotta, talked about couple... sandboxing yet, but I think that the concept is 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 very much important and and salient to any conversation around both blockchain as a as a potential technology for use in state government as well as for fintech and regulations around it. Um, some other states have have introduced sandboxes, and and you know I don't know how well or how poorly it's been uh, received. But I think that it does give opportunities on both the technology and on the flexibility in the regulatory environment for companies to really prove out their model. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, if folks may have heard of a sandbox before, uh, the regulatory front, there's a couple states that have gone forth and tried to adopt these, basically creating sort of a safe harbor from companies that are sort of in a beta stage, trying out new projects. They might need a banking license. They might need a money transmitter license. But we're going to keep this kind of over, oversight control and sort of um, handle it that way. Um, but it doesn't solve sort of the maturity problem and the security problem and whether the solution is actually going to work, right? So um, I, I do think that they're sort of reimagining how we innovate and how we bring this technology to the forefront. Um, pushing it down through states, through the counties, working with private enterprise to try to build these. Working with existing partners may be a solution to help continue to innovate within government. So they gave me the one minute sign, so we'll do a quick lightning round. Maybe you can run down, tell me the, the project that you're, you've heard about here or elsewhere in the crypto community that you're excited about, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish up there. Uh, so I would say, and we were talking about this before the panel, um, I think central bank digital currencies is going to be a fundamental shift of how the world's finance and payment rails work over the next 10 years. Uh, I think it's probably going to start in authoritarian states and then percolate kind of elsewhere. But I think that shift to digitally native value transfer is going to be massive around the world. I'm going to have to put in a huge plug for... Um, they're creating a public good infrastructure for employment. 
uh, basically bringing together all of the gig workers and the worker economy and giving them the economies of scale in terms of, of collective barga- bargaining and, and just bringing power to those individuals to come together as, as, as groups and, and retain their, their sovereignty. Uh, mine's to be seen because every year now I, I get really excited about some of the projects that come through this event. So I hope whoever is out there hacking is uh, also thinking about ways that they can monetize this and create a company because we've seen it happen every year. So I really would love to see, especially some of those that are working on the Advanced Colorado uh, platform on some of those solutions, be able to solve some of these state problems because then I think we can build some businesses around that. Might not be the most exciting project for those of you under 65 in the room, but I'm from Wyoming. You have to remember the median age is is practically 65 in Wyoming, but e-wills, e-wills on the blockchain. So doing away with almost a thousand years worth of how we think about our um, after death world of wills um, and solving the authenticity and reliability problem by simply having both e-will and um, logging it on the blockchain. So I'm thinking back to the question about how is, how is this all funded? How is this all paid for? And I think that by adding one additional parameter to whether or not you feel like blockchain is applicable to your use case, um, have, a, have a yes, no checkbox for is fraud happening there, right? So anything that, uh, that has fraud occurring in it, um, putting, it, putting it, the workflow on the blockchain and reducing that level of fraud essentially pays for itself. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. Check us out later. Have a good one.